If one were to listen to various people and movements today, one would think that Britain was the last country on earth to abandon slavery. That she contributed nothing to abolition and only ever sought to enrich herself by continuing to trade in human cargo for as long as possible. Instead, abolition is either thought to have been an entirely American affair, or is just ascribed to some vague notion of something happened somewhere. In truth, it was Britain who foremost pushed for this change. William Wilberforce is the man who dedicated his life to abolishing the slave trade, but he was far from alone. He had a great many allies in his struggle to convince the public and parliament to abolish the trade. The Reverend John Ramsay, who had been a surgeon in the West Indies and had been horrified by the treatment meted out to the slaves on the plantations. Ramsay became a priest in the village of Teston in Kent, where he formed an influential circle with people such as Charles Middleton, Thomas Clarkson and Hannah Moore, among others. The group became known as the Testonites. But foremost, the Quakers, as a religious organisation, opposed slavery. They set up committees from about 1780 onwards, campaigning for abolition. Josiah Wedgwood, the famous pottery industrialist, who was an avid supporter of abolition and who furnished all manner of pottery and plaques advocating for the end of the trade. Joshua Reynolds, the famous portrait painter of the age. John Newton, the famous slave ship captain who became a repentant clergyman and who wrote the song Amazing Grace. William Pitt the Younger, who went on to become Prime Minister, was a close friend of Wilberforce's, and again supported his efforts wherever it was possible for a leading politician to do so. Charles James Fox, a prominent member of the Whigs in Parliament, and the fierce political rival of Pitt the Younger. And William Grenville, yet another future Prime Minister. Olauda Equiano, who had himself been a slave and managed to buy his own freedom, then went on to write a successful book about his time as a slave, and naturally, campaign for abolition. Wilberforce was also part of a group known as the Clapham Sect, or the Clapham Saints if you prefer. This was a group of devout Anglicans living in the Clapham area who sought to improve society, one of the chief causes of which was of course abolition. The group included, among others, Hannah Moore, who was already a member of the Testonites, Thomas Gisborne, a priest and poet, William Smith Thompson, a member of Parliament, Granville Sharp, another clergyman, son of the Archbishop of York and one of the earliest to pick up the struggle for abolition. Charles Grey, a member of Parliament and another Prime Minister-to-be. Over time, there were petitions signed by a great many members of the public, amounting to hundreds of thousands of signatures. Much as the various names I've mentioned so far were members of a very exclusive elite in Britain, abolition was also a grassroots movement, especially in the churches all around the country, the mood gradually swung against the trade. All the while, these committees and saintly society circles worked towards achieving this aim. But there were serious obstacles to overcome. The trade made money. Therefore, there was a strong political lobby seeking to protect it. Now, it is easy to argue that this was just the pursuit of profit, simple greed writ large. But ships need ports. Cargoes need to be stowed by labourers. Ships need built, victualled and maintained. Goods need to be produced, which in turn may be used to purchase slaves in Africa. A large number of jobs depended on the Atlantic trade, at a time when Britain still had a large proportion of its population living in abject poverty. The Industrial Revolution was only just getting going. Another issue you need to consider is that Britain's great rival was France. For a considerable part of the time it took for the struggle for abolition to succeed, Britain was at war with France. Britain was not about to abandon a lucrative trade only for her rival to be able to pick it up instead. One was not going to hand an advantage to the French. In fact, the war with France set back Wilberforce's movement by some time, but in the end he would succeed. Wilberforce's first attempt at an abolition bill was in April 1791, the bill being defeated 163 to 88. The next year, in 1792, Parliament passed a motion to aim for gradual abolition. It set no date and was a classical political fudge, committing no one to anything specific, but it did concede in principle that something ought to be done. Wilberforce, the Quakers and Saints persevered. In 1806, Wilberforce's abolitionists then lent their support to a loyally trick which completely wrong-footed their opposition. One proposed a bill prohibiting any British subjects from having any part in the slave trade to French colonies. All perfectly patriotic stuff, one was after all at war with France. However, most slavers, whether British or otherwise, were supplying both friendly as well as hostile colonies. They usually did so flying the American flag, hoping thereby to rely on American neutrality, and thus not to be attacked by the privateers of either side. 
Well, this law did away with it. If you were a Briton and had any part in supplying a colony of France or her allies, you could be prosecuted, no matter which flag you flew, no matter what ship you were on. You were fair game. They could hunt you down across the sea. More so, privateers were now emboldened to go after slavers flying the American flag. Whether it was a British ship or a French ship, in reality you really became much of a muchness, once it was flying a flag of convenience. What slaver would set sail now that his ship could be seized by privateers? It was a devastating blow to the financial viability of the slave trade, but one hidden behind a facade of patriotic sentiment during the war. When proposing this, Wilberforce and his people remained silent on the issue in order not to alert the pro-slave trade lobby as to what they were really up to. The Foreign Slave Trade Bill was passed that same year in 1806. Then came a general election, and the slave trade was now sufficiently prominent a matter to be an issue in the campaign itself. When Parliament resumed, more abolitionist MPs entered the House of Commons. More so, the slave trade lobby was losing ground as it now had much less money and power thanks to the previous year's Foreign Slave Trade Bill. The writing was on the wall. Once again it was proposed to abolish the slave trade, and the issue already being settled in the Second Chamber, the House of Lords, the Commons then voted, and Wilberforce was to win with a thunderous majority of 283 votes to 16. The Slave Trade Act was made law in 1807. At the Congress of Vienna, which sought to settle European affairs after the Napoleonic Wars, Britain, now completely committed to ending the trade, extracted a pledge from her fellow European nations to abolish the slave trade. This was in 1815. Throughout his time as a member of Parliament, Wilberforce suffered from ill health, making his struggle all the harder. By 1826, he resigned his seat as a member of Parliament, as his health would simply no longer allow him to continue but he nonetheless continued to campaign for the complete abolition of slavery. It took time to get there, but in 1833 the British Parliament passed the Slavery Abolition Act, outlawing slavery in the British Empire. William Wilberforce, gravely ill, learnt of government concessions which would allow the bill to pass and knew his work was complete. He died three days later. He was laid to rest in Westminster Abbey, close by his good friend Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger. And as many will know, Westminster Abbey is where Britain honoured her greatest and best. They knew he had been great. They honoured him in Parliament. Among his pallbearers were a Duke, the Lord Chancellor, and the Speaker of the House of Commons. But so far this was the story of the gradual change of heart by the British regarding slavery and how it was outlawed after a long struggle. But outlawing it was only half the tale. Now it needed to be done. First, the bill against slavery throughout the empire also included provisions for £20 million to be set aside by government for the compensation of slave owners, who had been acting perfectly within the law and now saw their investment nullified. At the time, this was a colossal sum. So yes, the British government effectively bought the slaves for £20 million and set them free. But the British effort did not end there, for it was for the Royal Navy to enforce the will of Parliament. From 1808 onwards, the Royal Navy kept a squadron patrolling the waters off Africa in the hunt for slave ships. This was the famous West Africa Squadron. It started small, with only two ships, but it grew soon enough. By 1818, it had its first Commodore, Sir George Ralph Collier. If at first the squadron struggled to hunt down the slave ships, this was set to change. One of the best known ships was the formidably named HMS Black Joke, who succeeded in capturing quite a few of them. She, in turn, had been a slave ship herself, which had been captured by the 38-gun frigate HMS Sybil, which, ironically, also had been captured, this time from the French Navy. But the figures are quite astonishing. Between 1808 and 1860, the West Africa Squadron captured 1,600 ships and freed 150,000 slaves. Also worth mentioning here is the Aberdeen Act of 1845. The Act is named after British Foreign Secretary Lord Aberdeen. It authorised the Royal Navy to stop and search any Brazilian ship that was suspected of being a slaver. The men running these were to be arrested and tried in British courts. By this time, Britain regarded the slavers much like pirates. The Brazilian slave trade at that time was growing, as free trade in sugar with Britain was booming. Brazil had signed a treaty with Britain in 1826 agreeing to outlaw the trade, insisting the plantations cope with existing slave populations, but everybody knew it wasn't being enforced so the British enforced it for them. The Royal Navy got so bold as to begin entering Brazilian waters, even her harbours, to get its hands on the slave ships. At one point a British ship even exchanged fire with the Brazilian fort. 
but Brazil could not hope to defy Britain, who was quickly becoming the world power and had a navy no one could rival. New legislation was drawn up in Brazil, and this time the prohibition of the slave trade was enforced. So the truth is, Britain obliterated the trade. Yes, we had partaken in it, but that was because we were the foremost naval power. It was not going to be the Poles or the Egyptians who dominated the transatlantic trade routes. We had copied the practice of black slave worked sugar plantations from the Dutch, who in turn had copied it from the Portuguese. We simply grew very successful at the game. But it was British society which gradually brought about the change, which felt its conscience pricked by what was happening, and which eventually decided it could no longer permit for this to happen. It was the British who insisted on the Europeans committing to the abolition of the slave trade, when matters were settled after the fall of Napoleon. It was the British who enforced the law Brazil had passed, but proved unwilling to police. It was the British who committed a great many ships, a great deal of manpower, and vast sums of money to ending the trade in humans. You may complain they did not act soon enough, but you need to concede that no one else was acting either. Western civilization evolved over time. It reached this point, and it did so in Britain. After the event, everyone is wiser, just as the wheel seems an obvious invention to all of us, but it seemed to take some time for mankind to get there nonetheless. The same with the abolition of slavery. It was an insight, an insight which was there for some time, a kernel of truth, if you will, whereby the principle that all men are equal and are to be treated so before the law needed to work its way through to its final conclusion, that one had had enough of excuses and exceptions and wished to see the very principle applied, once and for all. We changed the world by first changing ourselves, and then applying ourselves to the task of human liberation like no people had ever done before. One needed to get there. Evolution takes time. One did not get there on the African continent, the very place which should have known most about the horrors of casting people into slavery. Neither did one reach the insight in the very colonies where the slaves were working the fields, but on the rainy island set into the Atlantic that was Britain, in the place where the fledgling imperial power was finding its feet. There one reached that point of no return, one of the foremost fruits of the Enlightenment, plucked from the tree of history by British hands, was the abolition of slavery. It was in the home of liberty that is the United Kingdom that at last the decision was made not only to cease it for oneself, but to use one's power to see others commit to this cessation and to use one's command of the sea to hold them to their commitment. And should you be an American and scoff at the idea of Britain being the home of liberty, ask yourself what your founding fathers were before they put pen to paper and broke with the damp little isle across the Atlantic. They were British. They were steeped in the ideas, in the culture of Britain. They applied those very British principles to their new surroundings, to their specific context. In doing this, they created something new. Again, an evolution. But one neither from a French nor a Dutch, but a British starting point. From a British desire for liberty. There is something that resides here. Something which rejected serfdom. Which defied great powers again and again. And which was willing to stick its neck out to be free. If you know this island, most of all if you know some of its history, then you are unlikely to be surprised that it was Britain which, after the continued existence of slavery throughout the history of mankind for millennia, simply said, no more. That's all from the Cyberpass for now. Thank you very much, and goodbye.